So um, hello everybody and, and welcome to the Challenging Racism Projects seminar series. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and today we have the pleasure of hosting Professor Mark Rubin, who's generously taking time to speak with us during his visit from the UK. Before I introduce him, I would just like to take a moment to acknowledge country. With respect for Aboriginal cultural protocol, and out of recognition that its campuses occupy their traditional lands, Western Sydney University acknowledges the Darug, Eora, Darawal and Wiradjuri peoples and thanks them for the support of uh, its work in their lands. I myself am dialing in from Darug and Gundungara country and I acknowledge that Indigenous custodianship has protected the lands, waterways and skies for millennia. These lands were never ceded and Indigenous Australians continue to face injustice in contemporary Australia. And if you would like to acknowledge where you are dialing in from, please do so in the chat. So Professor um, Mark Rubin um, is a Professor of Psychology at Durham University. He has published several articles on issues connected with the replication crisis in science. In particular, he has argued that it's not always problematic to engage in questionable research practices, such as hypothesizing after the results are known and undisclosed multiple testing. He has also criticized some science reforms, such as pre-registration and stricter adherence to Neyman Pearson hypothesis testing. Nonetheless, he is generally in favor of other open science reforms, such as open access preprints and open data and materials in post-positivist science. Mark will speak for about 40 minutes um, so that we leave plenty of time for questions at the end. So if you have a question, please put it into the chat or if you have an urgent question, feel free to raise your virtual hand so that Mark can see that and pause midway. Um, so over to you, Mark. Thanks very thank much, Simlin. And thank you everyone for inviting me along today. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, I, I look forward to sharing my own thoughts and, and hearing your own views about uh, this this topic. Um, Stephen, can you? Yeah. So, just, so um, I'm a social psychologist. But I got interested in this area in 2001, uh, following a bit of an uproar, um, because uh, a guy called Daryl Bem published work in Social Psychology's flagship journal that provided evidence of precognition. So this magical phenomenon was supposed to be um, have some scientific backing behind it. Now, I don't know if precognition is real or not, but um, certainly um, it was a you know, very confusing moment when uh, such a prestigious journal published that work. And coincidentally, that was the same year that um, Simmons et al published work showing that by fiddling around with data collection and analyses, you can present any result you like as significant. So the usual sort of way of performing hypothesis testing seemed to be fallible and seemed to be manipulable by researchers to show what they wanted to show. And a year later, John et al. showed that many psychologists reported fiddling around with their data collection and analyses. So it wasn't just a one-off thing. Lots of people were doing this sort of behavior. So you can kind of think, well, you know, maybe Ben was uh, also fiddling with his data in order to provide this evidence for precognition. And then everything really came to a head in 2015 when the Open Science Collaboration published work showing that only 39% of a sample of psychology effects were replicable. So there's this kind of timeline where we were all going along okay and then people started to find out suddenly precognition is real according to scientific standards. Scientific standards are a bit iffy and that scientists can play around with them, and that a lot of the results we thought were robust and replicable were in fact not. So um, 
that has led us to uh, the, the replication crisis. And the culprit of the ensuing replication crisis is supposed to be researchers' methodological behavior. So researchers key hacking, harking, which we talked about just a second ago, hypothesizing after the results are known, and other questionable research practices are supposed to be flooding the literature with false positive results that then turn out to be non-replicable. And so we need a discipline that could analyze and change researchers' behavior in order to improve science and make it more replicable. I mean, all this is founded on the idea that replication is a good thing and that science is, you know, it's a cornerstone of science. And so this 39% replication rate is bad and we need to try to improve it. And so uh, we need to solve the replication crisis. Who do we call, uh, not Ghostbusters, but meta scientists? So what is meta science? Uh, basically, it uses the scientific approach to understand and improve the scientific approach. So it's kind of like physician heal thyself. Um, scientists are using science to try to improve science. Um, so a, a lot of contemporary meta science is currently associated with understanding the causes of the replication crisis and implementing reforms like open science, open access, pre-registration. So these are the scientific reforms that are um, you may have heard of this. Now, um, I'm going to be basically criticizing or, or questioning, I think, some of the assumptions behind modern meta-science. Um, but one thing I want to make clear from the start is that meta-science is, or at least should be, a broad and heterogeneous interdisciplinary approach. So during my talk today, I'm going to be inevitably wrong if I say all meta-scientists think this or believe that, and that's not my intention today. I mean, I might accidentally slip up and, and, and make that mistake, but really in my heart, as it were, I do uh, believe that meta-science is a, a heterogeneous kind of a discipline and we should treat it that way. So my intention is to highlight and question a few assumptions that some meta-scientists may hold today. Um, and the other thing to note, I think, um, is that meta-scientists are scientists, the, the, you know, the clues in the name, and that scientists often take on the role of meta-scientists when they critique their peers' research from a general methodological, statistical, or philosophical perspective. So often when you're reviewing work, you might you know, as, as a reviewer too, you might put forward some a broad kind of um, criticism, which really is a criticism of the approach that the scientist is using. And that's, I would say, a meta-scientific um, criticism in that respect. So given that we can swap roles like this, I think it's inappropriate to consider meta-scientists and scientists in terms of us and them, because we are often, are often them, we often switch roles. So anyway, let's have a look at um, the meta-scientist narrative, the mainstream narrative uh, that some meta-scientists have argued is sort of underlying the replication crisis. So the argument is that questionable research practices such as parking and p-hacking, and, and I'll you know, come to those in a little bit later, um, have led to a higher than expected false positive rates in the literature. Um, there's also this point that publication bias prevents null results from being reported, you know, so editors, reviewers, and so on, if you submit null findings, they might reject and say, well, this is not really useful or relevant or interesting. So they're not gonna get into the literature. And there are also our own sort of cognitive issues here. So researcher biases, such as the hindsight and confirmation bias, uh, reduce researchers' awareness of these issues, and so they expect everything to be fine. And from their perspective, uh, the hindsight bias is, well, I knew this was going to happen anyway, uh, and the confirmation bias is taking on board things that you believe sort of support your hypotheses and ignoring the stuff that doesn't. And so because we have these cognitive biases, you're not really um, 
noticing uh, th these problems that, that are arising. Consequently, it's a bit of a shock then when you know the hard evidence hits you in the eyes and you go, oh goodness, replication rates are much lower than I expected. Why is that the case? It's, and, and that feeling of um, particularly low replication rates leads to this replication crisis. So here's some of the things I'm going to talk about today. Um, there are some meta-science assumptions, um, and they they lie behind this mainstream meta-science narrative. I believe um, I'm going to try and address as many of them as possible, given given the time. We might not get through all of them, but um, the one thing to notice here is that you'll you'll see that I use the word bad a lot. It's kind of a silly term, which is an oversimplification. Oversimplification. Um, but it, I think it's useful anyway, because it kind of does capture the moralizing aspect of the mainstream narrative. And that is that the replication crisis has been caused by bad research practices, questionable research practices, and that if we engage in better, more rigorous, more credible, more transparent research practices, we will then escape the crisis. So the crisis is our fault as researchers rather than anything uh, anything else. Um, I also want to uh, talk about, uh, I'll, I'll talk about some of my papers in this area. So like I say, I got interested in this area um, in around about 2017 um, when I published a few papers, but I, I've got an ongoing interest. It just really captures my imagination. I, I think we should all, you know, step back and think why we're doing what we're doing. And meta science is a really good vehicle for doing that, I think. Um, my own approach to meta science, uh, sort of a critical meta science approach, is to try to add some nuance to some of these arguments that have been put forward. So, for example, instead of saying that harking is bad, full stop, I ask, when does harking hurt? And consider some of the situations in which it's not problematic. So, I think that black and white, there needs to be a lot of shades of gray in between. Um, it might be useful also for me to step back a bit myself at this stage to try to outline my own philosophy of science, although I have to admit I'm a bit fickle about this. I'm always sort of changing my mind. But um, at the moment today, um, I subscribe to perspectival realism or model dependent realism, if you prefer Stephen Hawking's terminology. Um, and basically, perspectival realism assumes that there is a reality. Um, but we can only have perspectives on it. Um, luckily, we can have different perspectives on it. And through a lot of arguing and bickering amongst ourselves, we can arrive at kind of a social consensus, which is more accurate than either of our individual perspectives, but which is still nonetheless perspectival. Um, as a social psychologist trained in the social identity perspective, I'd call this social consensus a social reality. So that's the reality part of it for me. Uh, it's a key part of realism. Um, but I'm also inspired by the classics, uh, Popper uh, and Lactos. Um, and I don't see any contradiction between perspectival realism and Popper's sophisticated methodological falsificationism, bit of a mouthful. Um, for example, in his so-called searchlight theory of science, Popper explained that what the searchlight makes visible will depend upon its position, upon our way of directing it, and upon its intensity, its color, etc. Although it will, of course, also depend very largely on the things illuminated by it. So that's the reality. Um, so that, that's sort of where I'm coming from. Now, the problem or, or benefit of perspectival realism is that I can't say any of the meta science assumptions I'm talking about are wrong. Uh, I have to concede that from a certain perspective, they're all right. But what I can do is offer an alternative perspective and hope that you feel it's worth paying a little bit of attention to. Okay, so that's the structure. I'm going to run through some of those assumptions and, and give my perspective on, on each one of them. So the first one is um, the idea that prediction is better than Post-diction, again, that's a bit of an oversimplification about what people say here, but um, it's the kind of narrative that there is that we need to predict, and we can't sort of hypothesize after the results are known 
even transparent. Um, and the idea is that prediction is better or less tentative than post-diction or sometimes called accommodation. Um, and this is why we need to transparently distinguish between the two in order to avoid post-diction being disguised as prediction. So in my view, the problem with that assumption is that if you look at the philosophy of science, you'll see that there has been a decades long debate about that issue and the jury is well and truly out. So some people say yes, some people say no, and some people say it depends on the circumstances. And more recently, some people say it depends on who you ask even. Um, certainly there's agreement against the naive or strong position that prediction is always better than post-diction. Um, but I think that the general takeaway here is that the typical meta-science assumption that prediction is better than post-diction post certainly shouldn't be taken for granted. Um, it depends on the situation. It depends on your epistemic goals. That seems to be a, a safer conclusion to me. And a similar assumption is made about confirmatory and exploratory research, which are similar kinds of concepts. Um, Exploratory research is regarded as being more tentative because it is more likely to represent post-diction and or accommodation. Consequently, meta-scientists argue that falsely portraying exploratory as confirmatory can give a false sense of confidence about the research. And that's why pre-registration, which is you know, writing down what you're going to do beforehand and putting it Sort of registering it in a publicly available repository so that people can cross-reference and check whether what you've done is what you said that you would do. Um, that is supposed to distinguish between confirmatory and exploratory. But again, I think that line of thinking assumes that there is a relatively clear distinction between confirmatory and exploratory, when in fact, I don't think there is. So I can talk you through that a bit more. So at the top there, we've got these two columns, confirmatory and exploratory, and, the, and they can be described in many different ways, some overlapping ways, potentially. Um, one way at the top there, some people use the terms confirmatory and exploratory to refer to hypothesis testing and descriptive research, respectively. The problem with that definition is it's a bit loose because it implies that statistical tests of unplanned hypotheses are confirmatory because they're statistical, even when the hypotheses are generated after seeing the data. And so I think that most meta-scientists would not agree with that, uh, with that definition. Some people say that confirmatory analyses are independent from the current results and exploratory analyses are based on the current results. But then what happens if we pre-register an analysis that's designed to change depending on the results that we get in our analyses, perhaps using decision trees. So for example, we might pre-register that we'll drop items from a scale if they reduce the scale's reliability, okay? Now, even though that approach is pre-registered, it should still be described as exploratory according to this definition because the scale items that we use in our analysis depend on the results in our reliability analysis. Some people say that confirmatory and exploratory analyses refer to strong and weak theory respectively, but then presumably that means that even pre-registered hypothesis tests should be described as exploratory when they're based on vague and weak theory. And in that case, pre-registration isn't really doing a very good job at distinguishing between confirmatory and exploratory. What about the idea that confirmatory and exploratory refer to planned and unplanned analyses respectively? The problem here is that planning to undertake a data dependent exploratory analysis doesn't really make it a data independent confirmatory analysis. So planning per se doesn't really seem to be the crucial issue here. And maybe confirmatory and exploratory analyses refer to predictions and post-dictions like we just talked about. But predictions could come from anywhere. 
For example, if I toss a coin to predict whether men or women will have higher self-esteem, then I've made a prediction and I can pre-register that prediction. Um, but it's not linked to any theory. So confirming that prediction will have no scientific value. It will just prove Mark's right. It doesn't really tell us anything else. So I think we have to question whether the timing of a prediction is really the key thing here and whether the source of the prediction, in other words, theory or just the toss of a coin, is more important. And finally, some people link confirmatory and exploratory research to hypothesis testing and hypothesis generation, respectively. But what happens if we view our results and then retrieve a hypothesis from the literature that is confirmed by them? Does that count as hypothesis generation or hypothesis testing? I think it's debatable because the hypothesis was generated before the result was known, but used to explain the result after the result was known. So in summary, when you start to pick at it, the distinction between confirmatory and exploratory tends to fall apart, in my view, and science reforms like pre-registration don't really help to distinguish it. I mean, pre-registration may help to distinguish confirmatory and exploratory research, or perhaps pre-registered and non-pre-registered research, but it doesn't really explain why that distinction is important in the first place. Why should we care? Um, okay, so the last issue of hypothesis testing there um, is an interesting one because it relates to the issue of harking or hypothesizing after the results are known. So let's consider some of the ways in which mainstream meta-scientists think that harking is bad. So this is a little quote from um, Brian Nozak, who's a, a, a leader in this area, uh, and a very thoughtful person about these issues, I should say, and quite nuanced in, in his views as well. Um, so as they pointed out, harking is potentially problematic because post hoc theorizing sometimes leads to circular reasoning, which is in which the same result is used twice. So it's used once as part of the theoretical rationale for the hypothesis. Why are we proposing this hypothesis? It's because of the result. And then a second time to provide support for that hypothesis. Why are we saying that hypothesis is being confirmed? It's because of the result. So in other words, the same result is being used to both generate and test the hypothesis, which is bad. So I, I, I totally agree that this double use of the same result is problematic. No arguments from me there. However, harking doesn't prevent you from identifying that circular reasoning. So you don't need to know the true timing of a researcher's reasoning to know whether that reasoning is circular. The circularity is a question of logic, not of history or timing. And so you don't need to look at the content. So you only need to look at the contents of the reasoning. So my point here is things like pre-registration aren't necessary to identify this sort of stuff. Uh, <clears throat> Karl Popper himself made this point. Uh, the logical properties of statements are timeless. If a statement is a tautology, then it's a tautology once and for all. I I'll quote a bit of Popper as I go along. And the reason I do so is um, like I say, I'm sort of interested in that area myself, and I think he's a very useful guy to, to talk about. But Popper has also been sort of embraced by the meta science and the science reform movement. And so, you know, I think it's, it's useful to consider his more nuanced views. So I can give you an example of where Harking doesn't hide this circular reasoning that we need to worry about. So imagine that a researcher tells you that they predicted that eating apples improves mood, but unbeknownst to you, they secretly harked this hypothesis after observing that eating apples improve the mood of participants in their study. So they've used the results as inspiration for their hypothesis. <clears throat> now imagine that the researcher provides the following theoretical rationale for their secretly harked hypothesis. Vitamin C improves mood, and apples are rich in vitamin C, therefore apples should improve mood. 
In this case, we can clearly see that their current results, eating apples improves mood, has not been used in either of the two premises that are used to deduce the hypothesis. Consequently, we can confirm that there is no circular reasoning in using the results to support the hypothesis. Now, the immediate response to that kind of argument is to point out that the researcher would never have come up with the hypothesis unless they'd attained the result that they did. And that's perfectly true. But is it problematic? Well, no, I don't think it is. I think it's perfectly fine for a result to inspire a hypothesis and for all sorts of ulterior, ulterior motives like the need to get published, to make researchers search around for a suitable theoretical rationale. According to Popper's deductive method of testing, all we need to do to avoid the fallacy of circular reasoning is to make sure that the current result is not used as a premise in the formal theoretical rationale. And a researcher's personal inspiration and motivation aren't included in the formal rationale. So they don't compromise what John Worrell, another philosopher, called the epistemic independence between the rationale and the test results. And this means that we can then legitimately use the test results to provide some support for the hypothesis. So more generally, I think it's important to appreciate that we're all motivated and biased in, in everything we do. Um, but those motivations and bias don't necessarily imply incorrect reasoning or invalid reasoning or unsound reasoning. And you don't need to know the timing of reasoning to identify incorrect, invalid or unsound reasoning. You just need to read what's on the page. So, for example, if I predict that apples improve mood because bananas are yellow, you're going to scratch your head and say, that doesn't make any sense. What the hell are you talking about? You, you know, you don't need pre-registration to appreciate that my reasoning is invalid in that case. Um, another concern here is that researchers who hark will only ever corroborate or confirm hypotheses and never falsify them. Of course, falsification is an important part of, of science. But as Norbert Kerr noted, and Kerr was the, the guy who sort of um, originated the term harking, that's not true. So researchers can hark disconfirmed hypotheses just as much as they can hark confirmed hypotheses. So on the right there, you can see my version of the classic Texas sharpshooter, sharpshooter analogy. Um, so here the, the, the guy is sort of shot bullets in the wall and then walked up to his bullet holes and started painting targets around them as if to confirm um, that he's you know, been successful. And here the bullets are sort of the evidence and the targets are the hypotheses and the targets with the holes in them are confirmed hypotheses. So this is sort of an analogy for harking. And yes, <clears throat> the sharpshooter has harked and the painted targets around his bullet hole um, in the top right of the fence there but he's also currently drawing a target where there is no bullet hole. So I've kind of adapted this picture a little bit and whited out the bullet hole in the middle there to make my point. Uh, in other words, he's harking a disconfirmed hypothesis because he's drawing a target that he's missed. So you can hark hypotheses that are disconfirmed. And in practice, researchers do this in the discussion section all the time when they hypothesize after the results are known and then rule out alternative explanations for their results. They say, here's, a, here's something that could have been the reason, but we rule this out because it's not supported. So it's not true that harking or exploratory research always leads to confirmations. Another concern here is that harking can be used to predict nearly any pattern of results in nearly any context. And again, no arguments from me, that is absolutely true. But in my view, that's an advantage of post hoc theorizing rather than a disadvantage because it increases our ability to explain our results. Now, just like a priori theorizing, post hoc theorizing may be good, average, or terrible. 
but we don't need to know whether a hypothesis has been harked in order to make those evaluations, like I was talking about before, the banana example. <clears throat> Furthermore, the quality of post-hoc theorizing should be taken into account in a process of inference to the best explanation. So for example, Popper argued that the mere predictive success was insufficient for corroboration. It's not simply that you've got results that support your hypothesis. In order to corroborate your hypothesis, you also need a critical evaluation of the relative quality of the theories. And only the best theory is then corroborated, where the best means it has the greatest explanatory power, content, simplicity, and it's the least ad hoc. Those are Popper's words, right? So it's, you don't just corroborate any old hypothesis. You have to have something that actually makes sense that is a, a good quality hypothesis. So in that context, then, the question isn't whether a researcher can provide a post hoc explanation of the results, because most researchers can cobble together an explanation that predicts their results. The question is, how good is that explanation relative to other potential explanations? And that's the question that the reviewers of your articles will always you know, pose to you, say, I'm not convinced because this hypothesis doesn't seem reasonable to me. So it's not just about the evidence. Um, there's also an ethical aspect to harking. Um, harking is often acknowledged to fall into this sort of ethical gray area. Uh, it, however, even Kerr conceded that harking is not necessarily unethical. As he explained, harking can entail concealment. You're concealing the timing at which you devise this, this hypothesis. So the question then becomes whether what is concealed in harking can be a useful part of the truth or is instead basically uninformative and therefore may be safely ignored at the author's discretion. So in my view, what's being, what is being concealed here is the timing at which you generated this hypothesis or retrieved it from the literature perhaps. And I think to answer that question, you know, is, is Harkin unethical? We need to consider whether hypotheses are generated by people or theories. If hypotheses are generated by people, then the time at which a specific person generates a hypothesis is a useful part of the truth and hiding that information by Harkin is unethical. So here's that side of the equation. So this is a slide by Denny Vorsboon, uh, exemplifies the view that hypotheses are generated by people, at least in psychology. Just read it out there, the importance of who says what. In advanced fields, it's not so important what the theorist thinks, what matters is what the theory says. However, in psychology, not the theory, but the theorist holds the phenomena together. Thus the theorist rather than the theory is making the predictions and that's why pre-registration is important. Now, certainly if you think that way, then you should also believe that the time at which the theorist generates the prediction is a useful part of the truth and hiding that information by Harkin is unethical and that's why, as Borsman says, pre-registration is important. However, is this science or is this just testing people's personal predictions? Is this testing a theoretical prediction or is it Mark tossing a coin and guessing wildly that men have higher self-esteem than women for no other reason than the coin landed heads? So personally, I side more with Mark Schaller here. Any truly rigorous approach to psychology and science requires that scientific hypotheses cannot be equated to personal predictions. Hypotheses must instead be articulated as deep personalized products of some systematic analysis and appraised accordingly. And if like me, you think that hypotheses are deduced from theories rather than generated by people, even in psychology, then the time at which a hypothesis is deduced from a theory doesn't form a useful part of the truth because the consequence of a logical deduction does not change over time. For example, the soundness and validity of deduction that vitamin C improves mood and apples are rich in vitamin C, therefore eating apples will improve mood, doesn't change depending on whether it's been made before or after 
we obtain evidence for that hypothesis. Furthermore, if you think that hypotheses are deduced from theories rather than from people, then it's not deceptive to say, as predicted by theory X, even when that prediction is deduced after a relevant result has become known, because the prediction refers to a timeless theoretical deduction rather than a specific person's guess about the, about the future. So you can say, as predicted by Newton, even, if you've, even after you've observed an apple fall from the tree. So my point then is that the temporal information that's concealed by Harking is only important if you're testing people's personal atheoretical guesses about the future. It's not important if you're testing theoretically deduced predictions. And in my view, the way in which psychology becomes an advanced science is to depend more on its theories, not less. Okay, so I can move on to, uh, away from Harking, spent a lot of time talking about it, to some other things. Um, one of the other sort of main um, memes of, um, of meta science is that uh, research bias is bad. So some meta scientists believe that pre registration and registered reports reduce researcher bias. For example, Vazir et al. explained that the aim of the registered report format is to reduce bias by eliminating many of the avenues for undisclosed flexibility in research, and Chambers described registered reports as a vaccine against researcher bias. I, I think the problem with this perspective um, is that researcher bias influences not only the post hoc selection of hypotheses, data, analyses, results, in other words, selective reporting, you know, which does occur, but also it affects the a priori selection of hypotheses, methods, analyses, evidence thresholds, interpretations. In other words, it researcher bias influences selective questioning as well as selective reporting. And I think that considering selective reporting without also considering selective questioning leads to a biased evaluation of researcher bias, if you follow me. Um, <clears throat> so for example, pre-registering the number of times that a researcher will toss a coin may help to identify and reduce any selective reporting of their results. In other words, only reporting when the coin lands heads, not when it lands tails. However, the reduction of that selective reporting will not reduce researcher bias if the researcher's pre-registered decision rule, what they're actually testing is heads I win and tails you lose, that kind of idea. Obviously it's a biased rule, you know? So as Clark Ella put it, the dice have often been loaded before pre-registration and, and the bias is sort of baked into an inherent in the pre-registered protocol. So in that sense, we're not reducing bias by pre-registration, we're actually reinforcing it in a sense, we're really reifying it. Um, and I think we need to adopt a more holistic appraisal of research bias to see that. And when, when we adopt that more holistic perspective, we can see that a pre-registered study may be even more biased than a non pre registered study because its selective questioning may be more problematic than selective reporting. More generally, if we step back a little bit, the concept of bias reduction assumes that researchers can somehow get closer to an unbiased evaluation, which to me smacks a little bit of naive objectivism and value free science. And as a perspectival realist, I think that. A more tenable position is that open science practices help to reveal different perspectives rather than uh, research biases. For example, a robustness or a multiverse analysis allows readers to understand how different analytical approaches produce or enact different results. So they allow us to expose potential biases rather than ostensibly reduce them by constraining researchers' degrees of freedom. Now, I've got like tons of slides <laughs> and I realize I'm kind of like uh, going on. I think I, I said to Cymbeline that I would stop at 12.40. Let me just see what I've got left. I'll talk, I'll, I'll finish off the stuff about research bias and then we'll, we'll have a little pause, see how we go. So um, yeah, just finishing up with research bias. It's a bit simplistic, 
But the social psychologist in me likes this quote by Hull. I think it gets across the general point that science is a social enterprise. And as such, the biases of individuals or the perspectives, as I would call them, are an inevitable and unnecessary to understand the reality that none of us can access directly by ourselves. So I will we'll consider a couple of specific research biases, the hindsight bias and the confirmation bias, just to kind of explain this a little bit more. So the hindsight bias is a tendency for researchers to fool themselves into believing that they predicted the results after they became aware of that results. So researchers may fool themselves into believing that they haven't changed their beliefs about hypothesis because they knew it all along. But the hindsight bias doesn't prevent researchers or readers from actually changing their mind about hypothesis. It only obscures this attitude change from their conscious awareness. So researchers may still unconsciously update their beliefs about hypothesis, even if they fool themselves into believing that they knew it all along. So in my view, you know, this is a bias, but it's, it's a good bias. Um, it's functional because it prevents scientists' need for self-consistency from obstructing scientific progress, right? They can, they can believe what they want. As long as they do actually change their mind, that's fine. Uh, and the second one is the confirmation bias, which is a tendency for researchers to interpret evidence as confirming the hypotheses. But importantly, this bias is stronger when researchers view hypotheses as being more plausible. So again, it actually facilitates scientific progress by preventing well-established, highly plausible theories from being disconfirmed too easily. For example, it's functional for us to believe or to have a confirmation bias towards the theory of evolution relative to uh, creationist accounts. So confirmation bias is a, is a good thing in that sense. Okay, I might stop there and see how we're going for questions at this stage. Um, Thank you so much, Mark. Um, it's great, really enjoyable. And I know people are very engaged, though a couple of people had to leave early. Um, so it won't take that to me, but it's just probably the time of day, trying to get a bit of a lunch break in. Fair enough. Um, do people have questions they'd like to jump in with? I'm aware that Mark's got a little bit more left in the talk that he would be happy to continue with, but let's pause and see if there are some questions that people would like to, um, to pose at this point. Silence is golden. Fero Ferosa, am I saying your name right? Absolutely. Um, I I'm a, a cuckoo in the nest. I'm from the School of Business. Hello. <laughs> I, uh, thank you very much. That was very, very fascinating. Um, I was just wondering, uh, you know, when we teach uh, leadership theories in, um, in, in um, management units, we also talk about styles of leadership. And I was just wondering whether the same cannot apply, particularly when we talk about uh, leadership in context and based on situa situationality. And a lot of um, qualitative exploratory research tends to, particularly in management, because it deals with people and people are unpredictable. And, and it's sort of when PhD students do their studies, it's a snapshot in time. So how, how does that work in over here, both with hindsight as well as confirmatory bias? I, I think, yeah, I mean, research, all studies are, are a snapshot in time. And you're right that we do need to sort of contextualize them uh, and, and interpret them within a broader context. Um, I, I think you can do that to some extent with, with things like pre-registration, for example. But I think, um, you know, taking pre-registration as, as an example, you are only getting that snapshot of, of mm. time and things change. Um, and things change. And so because things change, you know, it, interpretations, contexts, um, 
even science moves on. So the standards for science that we have at the moment change and will change. They are always changing. And so you can always go back and look at the study that you've done and look at it with fresh eyes in light of those changing standards, in light of the changing culture, in light of the different interpretations and different theories that have arisen and, and revisit it and rethink through the study you've done and reinterpret it. Mm. Uh, so I, I, am I am I getting... <laughs> Is yes, it... very much so. Uh, you know, I, I mean, if I were to give a specific example, um, recently in Australia, we had the overturning of um, a, a, a lady called Kathleen Folbig, you know, where they were convinced that she had murdered her four children. But based on the last 20 years um, evidence, empirical evidence that was provided that showed that they she had genetic um Mm -hmm. You know, the children had genetic conditions which had yeah. contributed. So, yeah. you know, that is an example of it. Really and, exactly. and it is the same with theory. I mean, you've mentioned theory X and um, I'm assuming you re are referring to McGregor's theory X and Y, where theory X says people uh, are more motivated in, extrinsically by money, reward, status, etc. Whereas mm -hmm. theory Y, people are motivated intrinsically. Uh, is that what you are saying? Yeah, I I, I think so. I mean, I, I mean that I, I saw that case as well of that lady who got released um, because the scientific standards changed, and that's a very good case in point. That you, you know, science does not provide facts; it provides fallible theories that mm. we then continue testing and may overturn further down the track. So um, we, we should not be too confident. We should always be worried. <laughs> anxious that mm. we're getting it wrong because in a sense we have to get it wrong in order to progress right. you know we if we've got everything right now then it's all done and we should give, give up and go home there's no more jobs for scientists because the scientist deals in uncertainty and ignorance and and mm. theories which must be fragile and fallible and eventually overturned for better theories in order for us to, prog to progress and, and the same goes with methods, our methods as well. Our methods are, in fact, I think, theories. Um, our, our methods of, of hypothesis testing, of, uh, you know, the, the um, Bayesian stuff you're talking about, the um, statistical significance, these are all theories that are all hotly debated. So our standards of science are, are always developing and always being replaced by better theories. And we can always look back in hindsight and, mm. and 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 re sort of evaluate the evidence that we've got. One sort of thing I I, I find a little bit problematic with some meta scientist perspective is the idea that the replication crisis suggests that everything that's gone before two thousand and eleven is a load of rubbish, and we should burn it all to the ground is the quote that they say and start afresh and only trust the work that is is being done rigorously credibly through pre-registration blah 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 okay now what's happened there is we've changed our standards but the, you know through through a pessimistic um sort of meta meta inductive argument you could say that 10 years from now we'll have different standards and that those people 10 or 20 years from now will say we can only trust stuff that's happened you know so trust is uh, is is a moving, shifting stand, uh, uh, sort of feeling that we have, and we we shouldn't trust anything. Right. We should we should always be doubtful right. about stuff and be a bit more modest about about what we're doing. I think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We do have time for a couple more questions. Um, I have a question, but I'd, um, it's perhaps another cuckoo in the nest question. I love that little framing. Uh -huh. But um, I want to make room in case any other guests are sitting with a question. Um, it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell what's going on behind the screen, isn't it? <laughs> mm. Maybe I'll jump into my question. It's about um, just this replication crisis. And uh, I come from social sciences. Um, and, it, you know, I'm thinking as you're talking, I'm thinking about the social sciences crisis of representation and the recognition of um, 
objectivity, how how fallible notions of objectivity are, and uh, sort of deep interrogation of the presence of the researcher. And I would just be interested to hear you talk about the um, those two um, sitting there in psychology, which which really straddles hard sciences and um, um, social sciences. I don't know if that's the right framing, but it'd be interesting to hear you speak about these different movements. I, I think it's a really interesting question. Um, there's lots of different definitions of objectivity. Um, and it's a really difficult sort of thing to get your head around. I mean, sort of the naive realist perspective is that there is a, a, an objective reality out there which we can kind of almost directly tap into and that the truth is is there, is, is out there rather than in here. Um, my, my own perspective, like I say, from a social psychological point of view is, is more to do um, with the idea that the, we need to have a social consensus in order to develop and to get closer to the truth. We can't really ever get to the truth because if we get to the truth, then again, job done, finished, stop science, it's all over. So one, one of the sort of issues with science is that it can never and should never try to get to the truth. It can only get closer to the truth to talk to use Popper's kind of idea of um, very similitude, which is this idea of moving closer to the truth. Um, I, I think that objectivity, I mean, if I, if I go back to that quote from Hull that I put up, is this idea of us having discussions of, of talking to one another. So objectivity is, is the product of um, a social interaction between scientists. So in my view, objectivity arises, and I would say also in Popper's view, objectivity arises when you send your manuscript off for peer review and it comes back with blimmin' reviewer two's nasty comments. Unfortunately, that is objectivity happening in practice. That criticism, the idea that you've written something down, that you've made your ideas objective and objectively criticizable, and then that a social institution, the peer review process, has then facilitated the formal criticism of your idea, whether you like it or not. I mean, you, you can criticize the criticism, but whether you like, like it or not, that process of critical uh, rationalism, to, to, to um, quote Popper, is the objectivity of science. It doesn't mean that we get things right. It doesn't mean that we get, you know, we access the truth. It means that we are able to kind of rule out errors. And in doing so, we hopefully get closer to an agreement between one another about what, what is less likely to be wrong. You see what I mean? So uh, as a social psychologist, I, that, that kind of idea of we're all trying to work with one another to get closer to the, the what we believe is the truth, um, sort of, makes me feel like, yeah, that, that fits my ideas. Yeah. Does that help? Thank you. Thank you. Well, we really have time for one more question. And I have a feeling that there is one more question sitting there behind one of those screens. So if anybody would like to turn their camera on or put their question in the chat. And um, I will just mention that we have recorded this session. I think you will have got a little, um, a, you know, been asked to agree to that. So I will circulate the um, recording of this of this um, session. And maybe it's uh, maybe it's time to wrap up. Maybe we get just a couple of minutes of an early mark, unless there's any final any closing comments you'd like to make, Mark. Let me have a look at my slides here. Um, I, I, well, I'll if I've got a couple, just a minute or two. I'll just this last one is is about sort of tying it all together and getting back to the replication crisis. I don't know if you can see that slide. The replication. Yes, can. Yeah, thank you. Um, so you know, is the replication crisis bad? Well, uh, you know, set, successful replications represent scientific progress by confirming current hypotheses. However, I think 
failed replications also represent scientific progress by motivating the generation of new hypotheses that explain why the replications failed, for example, by positing boundary conditions. So to, to wrap it all up, I think that although le low replication rates may indicate poor knowledge accumulation, they may also represent scientific progress um, by generating what Merton called greater specified ignorance, specifying new hypotheses that need testing. So personally, I view replication failures as opportunities for learning rather than causes for um, a crisis. And just to give two little final plugs, um, I have got a, a sub stack here where I, I talk about what I call critical meta science, which is the sort of stuff I've talked about today. Um, so feel free to sign up to, to that newsletter. Uh, the last thing I posted there was about pre-registration. Um, and on my website as well, I've got um, a whole list of different critical meta science articles, which have this um, kind of more nuanced view about the, the issues I've been talking about. Um, so please feel free to type in Mark Rubin Google sites and, and uh, that should pop up there as well. Um, other than that, thank you again very much for inviting me today. I think you found uh, what I said uh, vaguely interesting, um, food for thought maybe. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mark. Really great session. And thank you everybody for attending. And uh, we also have another seminar next Tuesday. Professor Stefania Paolini will be presenting. So do tune back in uh, this time next week, 12 o'clock. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Cheers, everyone. Thank you.